fearless and truthful. Provocative and controversial. We say it like it really is. With dignity and respect. Committed to free speech and common sense. Upbeat and entertaining. Straight talking and direct. We may agitate each other and you. Thought-provoking, heartfelt and passionate. Hello and welcome to The Pledge. Joe Lyser hit the headlines this week after revealing he'd made a monumental decision. The comedian took to Twitter to voice his outrage over German fashion company Hugo Boss allegedly targeting small businesses who use the word boss in their names. Rather than get mad, the funny man decided to get even by legally changing his name to, you guessed it, Hugo Boss. Which got me thinking about what my fellow panellists could be called to highlight things they disagree with. Femi, you could be Will of the people. <laughs> Nick, I'm ordering you to be John Barker. Oh. <laughs> and Rachel, it's only right that you honour the Iron Lady herself, <laughs> Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> Coming up on the programme, Greg's hearing the chime of wedding bells, Rachel thinks we need to do more to help youngsters from ethnic minority backgrounds, I'm saying convicted domestic abusers should be forced to take lie detector tests, and Femi is all for girl power. But first, it's Nick. The only thing missing was a declaration of war. A stony-faced Prime Minister, flanked by equally grim-faced advisers gravely intoning details of fatality rates, and predicted infection levels. Yes, this is the nation's response to coronavirus, with the main thrust being an attempt to contain, delay and mitigate. Some of the measures that might be taken include police only investigating serious crime, calling in the army, routine operations being cancelled and no-go zones being created. On the one hand, the government is keen to stress there's no need to panic and everything is under control. And yet on the other, it announces deeply troubling plans such as these. Meanwhile, as schools close, airlines cancel flights and collapse, stock exchange around the globe wobble and stores run out of products such as hand gel and face masks, the media is under attack for running so-called scare stories. Surely it's our job to tell you what's going on or have we unwittingly added to the chaos? Well, I think I've changed my mind. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I thought that we were, as the media, unwittingly helping the chaos. Uh, but I think the chaos is upon us. And uh, I, I don't think the media now is exaggerating uh, what's around. I think there's something quite serious going on. What is, uh, I mean, what is worrying about what is, what is it going to do to the economy in yes. all sorts of places, in all sorts of countries? Uh, I mean, I've just noticed myself in my own life, I think five things I was supposed to be doing in the next 10 days have been cancelled, which included... What a, sort of events? Well, there? one was going skiing with a bunch of people. Right, OK. And the, the people who organised it decided they didn't want us all to be in one place at the same time. Um, I was supposed to be going to a thing at a university tonight and I found out that well, there were 20 there and I was the only one still <laughs> going. And I do think there's... Um, there is, there is a degree of panic going on, but I'm not sure it's, it's whether it's right or wrong. Before I move it on, because you've been in the news business even longer than I have, how does the media exercise responsibility in a situation like this? Because get it wrong, and we have now seen panic buying of toilet rolls, I mentioned hand gel face. If you get it wrong, you actually but frighten I'm, the people. I'm, I, yes, I, you know, I had to go look back to all sorts of things. You know, if, if there was a shortage of bread, you knew oh, you were going to create runs or run, on... one Rottweiler or, attack somebody yes, and they're inviting everybody. Uh, yeah, we've and there's that. always that danger. But I, I, I think it's... We, I think what we're in the middle of is something quite serious. Yeah. More than serious than perhaps people like myself gave it credit for. There's quite an interesting uh, stat, which, uh, which I quite like. Which measures have you taken to protect yourself from coronavirus? 54% said nothing. Really? Now, I think I'm in that 54%. Okay. Right? I don't think I've done anything. Improve personal hygiene, 35%. Avoid crowded public places, 
avoid physical contact with tourists. I, mean, I don't know as a tourist. I don't have <laughs> physical contact with tourists, I, as far as I know. I want to ask you, either, well, you can either ask about your personal hygiene or the responsibility of the media and the markets. Have the markets been spooked because of the global news coverage? Yes, and when you look at people's uh, companies share prices, you're seeing losses, uh, declines in many areas. So yes, of course, it's impacting the market. But to your central point, uh, is the media fueling this chaos? Absolutely. And what's Absolutely missing? Absolutely that we are. Yeah. And what's missing okay. for me is context. So absolutely, the media should be reporting and updating us on what's going on with corona. But minute by minute, second by second, tallies of who's contracted the virus yeah. and using all manner of scare headlines and words and, you know, people dashing out. And there's shortages, as you said, I think it's in Australia, of toilet paper. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I think two things need to happen. I think that the media need to understand context because, yes, this is spreading, but the amount of people that are dying or getting critical ill because of this it's a very small okay. number Femi I would never try and downplay the seriousness of this aside from my asthma I'm not in the age group that's most likely to die from that but I would say that there is a difference between if there's a fire in a building if you shout here's the exit here's the exit here's the exit you're being constructive if you shout you're all gonna die you're all gonna die mm. that's creating what's panic. the media doing which one is it doing the media with the fact that it there's no need to report um, four more cases found as what? the as the headline. Why? Because it, you know, we don't need that. That's, that shouldn't be. That shouldn't be. That shouldn't How do you be, confront a problem that, if you don't know the size? That shouldn't be its own news story. The focus should be government. Government says do this. It, that's right. not. You're not. You're not helping people do anything by saying four okay. more cases as a separate news story. Yes, this story should include that. Okay. But okay, Rachel, do you not think you can only confront a problem if you know its size? I.e., we've got X number of cases and now it's X plus Y. And what, you don't see that? I think a lot of it is to do with uh, tone and measure. And uh, I do just want to show you this from the Evening Standard, just to look at the, the, the kind of uh, reporting that we have. I think this is really sensationalist and there's no need for it. But, this kind of terminology, war footing, is not necessary. Look, I think that the media at times like this becomes you know, it's even more important as a public service, you know, and it has a public service requirement to give us the information that we need uh, to, to manage and reduce the risk of this virus. And one of the things, I mean, you may have noticed that I'm not a big fan of, of the government. <laughs> they've mentioned it once or twice, but I was impressed with, you know, they're starting to have um, announcements and advertising. And one of the adverts that they've got coming out now is, uh, a visual about hand washing and the, the frequency with which we need to wash our hands. But they used a visual of a, of a doorknob uh, that is, you know, obviously a surface that, you know, gets, it's, mm. a, it's a virus, it's a Petri dish, essentially. And they found that actually using that visual mm. had more power because the reaction is discussed than just saying you should wash your hands, you should wash your hands. Um, so I, I like that they have taken that consideration and taken advice on what the most um, impactful public messaging is. Let's just see what the government's saying before I bring uh, Greg back in. Health Secretary Matt Hancock, we all have a role to play in stopping this disease. Washing hands regularly is the single most important thing that an individual can do. Public safety remains our top priority. The government and the NHS are working 24-7 to fight this virus. It's imperative that everyone follows clinical advice by contacting NHS 111 and not going to A&E if you develop symptoms. It's funny, isn't it, Greg? A little while ago, we didn't need experts anymore, but the Prime Minister, <laughs> yeah. earlier this week, found himself flanked by two. Suddenly, well, they're I, back in vogue, well, experts. He, he, want, he needs someone to take account, doesn't <laughs> yeah. he? He needs someone to take the responsibility. But the media's under attack here, Greg. Right. We, apparently, we're not reporting um, it right. I think it's very difficult for the media in these circumstances because I think uh, all of us are uh, fixated by this. Mm at this particular moment and therefore I think the media inevitably going to be put, I'm not sure you want headlines like that, but I do think that it is inevitable that the media will report it because we want it reported. Yeah. I don't I, think we're all fixated by it. Uh, I'm not fixated by it. Are you? No. But, have you changed any aspect of I'm going to go around really quickly. You haven't, have you? Have you bought hand gel or wash your hands more or whatever, whatever? No, but what I would say is... Have you is, stopped hugging tourists? No, I mean, I'd love a hug off a tourist if anyone wants to hug me, quite frankly. But um, what I would say is I'm getting on a flight after this show Where and to? I've actually, I'm going to spin, right. and I've actually started thinking to myself, oh God, I'm going to be in an airport where everyone's been everywhere and do I need to get a mask? So it has had an impact on you? 
Yeah, but I think that's ridiculous attitude but from me. Greg so is that's right. scaremongering. It, but it ha Greg is right, hasn't it? So it has <laughs> had. You are thinking about it. But not in a good way. No, no, no. But no, it doesn't have to be positive. <laughs> have you changed your life? Um, it's made me think a lot more about hand washing, and also it's made me think a lot more about my phone because that is also a, a massive petri dish, mm. apparently. But I, can I just say that I think that you've raised an interesting point when you talk about experts, because in a social context, we're being asked um, in a society where we've been encouraged to be individualistic, yes. and the government has undermined our trust we don't in need experts. experts. Yeah. We are now being required to act collectively and on the basis of advice from experts. experts. So it's quite a change. <laughs> yeah. so, Femi, I must ask, have you changed your life? Uh, when I was ill, I self-isolated myself. So I was, I was worried. So I didn't see my flatmate, didn't really go outside much, didn't go to the shops, specifically because I was worried, what if it happens to be that? So I have done some change. But I think the media has the power to use their headlines to say, hand gels with alcohol in them specifically for example i think it's a really good thing yeah. that we are seeing some empty shelves that uh, where where the hand gels used to be because that why is it good to see empty shelves? that just causes panic doesn't it well, no no it means it means that people are doing the one thing that can slow the spread of this virus buying ha buying hand gels more than more so than we usually do yeah it's um i mean this is obviously going to run and run this story i mean i, I don't know when it ends i no. mean and there's all sorts of things i think that that, that come into question about sporting events, about theatres, about, I, mean, I don't know what happens, do you keep cinemas open? All these things are going to be discussed in the, in the weeks as, yep. as it moves on. To move on myself, as little as 20 years ago, I think it's unlikely the world would have been so welcoming to the news that the Prime Minister of the day was to have a child with his latest girlfriend having had four with his newly divorced wife and by repute possibly a couple with other girlfriends. What's even more remarkable is that this is a Tory Prime Minister and no one in the Tory party seems to care. It is a dramatic change from 20 or 30 years ago when such events would have led to a grassroots rebellion in the party, particularly amongst the blue rinse women who played such a powerful part in the Shire Conservative Associations. Remember, this was the party who forced Cecil Parkinson to resign as a cabinet minister because he'd had an Ill illegitimate child with his new girlfriend. And it was also the party who didn't elect Michael Portillo, the strong favourite, as their leader because he revealed he'd had a homosexual relationship while a student. We all know moral attitudes have changed beyond recognition. But every so often something happens which just demonstrates the scale of that change. So I agree with you um, and I do think it reflects a change in attitudes and what is socially acceptable these days and I support that because I think that you know this whole judgmental view of what constitutes a family and what constitutes this is okay but you're, you're not okay for, for a very long time it's been very rigid so I actually like the fact that kind of um, expectations have softened and lowered and that anything is kind of fine to some degree I guess um, I haven't liked a lot of the personal scrutiny and comment and judgment in the press like I think it was Alistair Campbell was tweeting poor kid and I just think all of that is a little bit much and I don't I don't know why so many people feel a need to pile in with personal um, judgment on someone else's private life so that's made me feel uncomfortable um, but yes I agree with you and I think that it's a good thing well, that things have changed it, it's interesting there's a stat that said that in 2017 48.1% of children born in this country were to parents who either weren't married or in a civil relationship Mm. And that seems to me a civil partnership, should I say? But do you think, the change, to me, do you think the change in society is a good thing? Uh, it, it is what it is. I mean, I can, I can hardly sit and say it's a bad thing. I had two children out of wedlock for a long time. My children all seem to be having children out of wedlock. Uh, so uh, who am I to criticise? And, and I don't. I think um, it's just something, a fundamental change that has happened. And it happens. And, and, and politics is always last to catch up with these things, but they've now caught up with this on, in terms of uh, children being born out of wedlock. Mm. Yeah. I was interested in the words you used, Michelle, you said expectations have softened. I think they've just become more realistic. I, I think that, I don't think it's softened, I think it is exactly as most people live their lives. And just to pick up, what I thought, and I really, I really support you on this, 
Look, Boris Johnson is, I can say, old enough and ugly enough to look after himself. I think some of the opprobrium that's been directed to this, this is this woman's first child, yeah. right? And I think some of the coverage of her has been really ugly, negative and also misogynistic. Mm. Uh, I, well, I want to bring in uh, a tweet from the Labour MP, Florence Shalomi, mm -hmm. um, who said, very convenient for this news to be announced today. Uh. Now, obviously... Um, Congratulations are to be extended to uh, uh, a couple expecting a baby, of course. But the timing is does is it slightly galling because I think that Boris Johnson is media managing us, and I find it annoying. So I'd like to remind you that on that day, you know, we had a top civil servant alleging that he was forced out, and he's now pursuing uh, legal action. We had all kinds of rumours about, uh, you know bullying and harassment culture um, in the treatment of the civil service and we had reports of a potential hit list that the government had uh, for permanent secretaries in the home office the foreign office face? and the treasury now what is annoying to me i think is that we are being media managed you know that boris johnson is playing the public for fools and my, i just wonder how long we're going to put but it, but it, it didn't work it didn't work did it I mean, because both stories became very big stories. Mm. Mm. And, uh, and Boris's came and went, actually, yes. to have the birth of the child. I'm, I'm like you, I congratulate them. Yeah, well done. Yeah. Congratulate the girl, she's, she's in her early 30s. It's yeah. an exciting moment in her life. But I don't think, the, I think they probably did try to media manage it. didn't work. It didn't well, the, have well the media picked up on it. I mean, the media was, you know, they would sure. have made Pravda proud the way that they covered this baby. Yeah, um, but they also picked up on Pretty Patel. Yeah, but yeah, as sure. Robert Peston pointed out, it did mean that there was competition for the front page the following yeah. day and the baby did win on a lot of on a lot of so papers. are you you genuinely believe that that was put out just because of that well the fact is when did they find out that i don't know we've yeah. all known yeah. we've the, all known well you know, i think all, po the all, politi known all politicians time. try to manage the news agenda mm. and always have done mm. but i don't think it worked nick's about to spontaneously combust <laughs> i just it, it, it's like we've never had Media, media management. I mean, yeah. the Labour Party, in a way, probably took it to its absolute peak, and I put that word in quotes, the good day to bury bad news, if you recall that, back on 9-11. So all parties have been guilty with it, but, but Greg has Should got I the... Did I say they weren't? No, no, but it was like... You, you so is it possible said, to make the point without you going, what, what about? Well, that's, that's why I couldn't believe you could keep a straight face as you were saying it, because they've all done it. But Greg, it's Greg's point is the absolute ceiling, uh, the crowning glory. It didn't work. The story is out there. We'd better say, as we've mentioned the Home Secretary, by the way, that this is what the Minister of the Cabinet Office, effectively the DPM, Michael Gove, has said about this. Uh, the Home Secretary absolutely rejects these allegations. The Prime Minister has expressed his full confidence in her. And having worked closely with the Home Secretary over a number of years, I have the highest regard for her. This government always takes any complaints relating to the Ministerial Code seriously. And in line with the process set out in the Ministerial Code, the Prime Minister has asked the Cabinet Office to establish the facts. But again, Greg, I think that's the story that's going to well, run you, and run as well. Well, you don't think that expressing confidence is... It's, it's a bit like the football club board, okay. isn't it? Yeah. You know, we, we express full confidence in the manager and we're going to sack him next week. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's, let's hear from what Sir Philip Rutnam said. He said, one of my duties as permanent secretary was to protect the health, safety and well-being of, of our 35,000 people. This created ten tension with the Home Secretary and I have encouraged her to change her behaviours. I have received allegations that her conduct has included shouting and swearing, oh, belittling people and making unreasonable and repeated demands, behaviour that created fear and that needed some bravery to call out. Sometimes people need to be shouted at. Not to be bullied, oh, not to no, harass, no, no, they no, need no, to no, be no, told, no. this isn't good enough. Go and I mean, yes, not shout, shout not at the shout top of your voice. To do that, Nick. Yeah, you can this say, isn't I'm good not, enough. Uh, do it just, again. Yes, but you don't have to do it in that way. It doesn't work do. anymore. Behaving like that doesn't work well, in running organizations. Right. It doesn't. Well, you, but you're... it works. You've worked for some pretty strange people, I suppose. <laughs> But, I find that really take worrying. It, let's take it back. Yeah, let's take to, the extent, to the extent that a top member of the civil service okay, so would actually resign because of it. That's the level of, well, of shouting alleged, and bullying. Allegedly, allegedly, okay. allegedly resigned. And of course, he also had issues reportedly with Amber Rudd as well. Mm. And that was also the department that served up information so dud, Amber Rudd lost her job. Mm. Someone working to you consistently produces dud information. The work is substandard. Mm. What do you do? Shouting will not, no, will no, not no, help no, anything. Okay. What do you do? 
um, um, say change your change your your behavior, change your performance. Otherwise, you um, go, there'll be consequences. You go it's through not processes. It's yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly right. You go through Shouting the top process. <laughs> you just said this isn't good enough. Yeah, yes, but, but yeah. yeah, but hang on, because their workplace isn't a single entity. So what works in one place to one collection of people would be ineffective in another. So I would argue that a, a fast-paced, high-pressured breaking news environment, you're going to be communicating and communicated to differently to yes. what you would be in, say, a tech startup in Shoreditch. It's going to be a very different style Good of point. management. And all as a manager, your job is to, is to communicate effectively to get the best out of your workforce. And mm. if shouting achieves that in your sector and field and people respond to that constructively, well, that's up to you. If you're in a sector where it really is ineffective, then as a manager, you've got to be able to manage your style to that all, workforce. First of all, I I think that that is absolutely wrong. I think that What's wrong? I think that you should there is there is no place for shouting in any workplace. But even on its own terms, Michelle, that's incorrect because Why as is? it turns out, the civil service does not respond well to bullying and being shouted Hang at. On, what's wrong? We you have union we what's have wrong? union leaders say uh, that the that the atmosphere in the civil service is unpleasant. Well, of it's putting what did people I say off. That was wrong? Well, no, so what what you said that was wrong which is that even on its own terms, you're saying there's some environments in which that works. There is. It doesn't there, work for the civil service there, as we found out. And but it, it might Michelle, not. Michelle is it's simple that people perform better when they're valued yeah. than when they're afraid. Well, yes, but and it's not I'm even saying, very complicated. How, yes, how, does, a saying, how does a Michelin kitchen how does a Michelin kitchen ever work unless there are the chef some environment yeah. you might not like it. But yeah. there are some environments where it is very robust. The cabinet should not be Gordon style. Ramsay's uh, kitchen. Exactly. <laughs> no, no one we said it is. No are one going said to it have was. to leave that one. <laughs> You'll be pleased to hear. Mm -hmm. According to a new report, BAME millennials have less stable working lives than their white peers. And the figures are staggering. People of colour in Britain are 58% more likely to be unemployed and 47% more likely to be on zero hours contracts. These figures hold even when you bring in other factors that may have an influence like gender, family background or qualifications. Meanwhile, those in unstable employment are more likely to suffer from poor mental health, which means, as Simon Woolley from Operation Black Vote says, it's a double hit if you're from a BAME community. When we talk about structural racism, this is exactly what it looks like. It's why British citizens from minority ethnic backgrounds have to send, on average, 60% more job applications to get a positive response. It's why some British universities are reportedly oblivious to the scale of racial harassment on campuses. We like to think that discrimination automatically vanishes, that people catch tolerance by osmosis as society moves forward and social attitudes change. But as the report on BAME Millennial shows, that is a misguided assumption. Nothing changes unless we all work to make it change. Yeah, um, I agree with you on, on that. I mean, what you said about uh, the need to send more applications if you're from an ethnic minority, that is painful. And I just want to tell a personal story, which isn't necessarily proof of racism, but it, it shows you the level of competition there is out there. When I applied to university, I applied to five unis, I, well, I actually had already completed my maths A level and got an A, and I was predicted three more A's. So I was predicted four, I had four, four A levels, A, coming at me, and I got five rejections rejected by every single union. That's the level of competition. Now, the surname Smith will never give an employer pause for th thought. The surname um, Khan, Mohammed, um, Oluwole, that might. And if you're dealing with that level of competition, the slightest pause for thought is going to make a massive difference. And that's one of the reasons why you're going to see massive disparities in terms of the number of applications that people need to send out. Mm -hmm. How is it to be tackled? What do you think? Because you've laid yeah. out very, very cogently the problems, mm -hmm. and that is appalling. If somebody with a, a last name such as yours, I mean, that, that's unconscionable. So how is it to be beaten? Yeah, that is actually the case. There was a, um, a report a year ago, I think it was, that actually sent out uh, CVs and just changed the name. Nothing else was changed. And I think, you know, somebody called Adam something like three or four times more likely to get an interview than... So how do we Gordon. alter it? What do we, I mean, there it's must good, be laws against that. Shit. There are laws against it. There's race, race yeah. discrimination that, but, but 
obviously it doesn't it. work. Yeah. You try proving it. And I think it's a really good question. It's something that organizations are looking at constantly, you know, racial equality, think tanks, etc. Um, you can have name blind recruitment. So you erase the names from the recruitment processes. Oh, OK. Uh, you, so you still know male 22 went to Oxford, yada, yada, but you have no idea of the name. Is that you have no is? idea right. of the name. Okay. You have no idea what they look like. OK. Um, mm. Some people are suggesting uh, so Simon Woolley from Operation Black Vote, who was involved in this latest report, uh, has suggested that you, uh, the, the government puts out a, a race pay audit. So in the same way that you have one for the gender pay gap, you'd have one for the race pay gap. Um, but it is, it's obvious, what's clear from this latest report is that it's obvious that it affects people at every stage. So it's from recruitment through whether or right. not you get a promotion, through to whether, you know, there are people of colour sitting at board level. So right the way through, it's something that, you know, structurally uh, needs to be challenged and addressed. Yeah, a long time ago, I, I produced a report that was called No Bloody Sometimes, right, which was basically the expression, and I, it was based upon a long interview I did with somebody who ran an employment agency, it's saying horrible. no bloody suntans, which was one of the phrases people used to say they didn't want ethnic minorities oh, wow. when they phoned them up. Now, I think when that, was that? The, oh, this must be 30 years ago. Thank God right? for that. Now, that I, think, that is, that I think has changed. <laughs> That, I think, is I think it is nothing as blatant as that anymore, but I do think the figures show there is still a big issue. And you tried to tackle this at the BBC famously. What year, how many years ago was that? Oh, that must be getting on. That's nearly 20 years ago. Rem remind uh, the uh, viewers what you did. Well, I got interviewed in a, in a, in a radio programme and I said that I, I thought that the BBC was hideously white. And uh, you, you cannot believe the attacks I got. I mean, the Daily Telegraph and the, I'm just came in at me, which you wouldn't get today. It's interesting, you wouldn't get it if you said that today, because everybody recognises the problem. We and then, why did they attack you? Oh, just because they said, well, it's weird, isn't it? You know, that old, that old Daily Telegraph reader view of the world, which was, you know, well, this is England, we're a white country, and all that stuff. Mm. They wouldn't do that now. That's the, the world has changed. But... What we try to do at the BBC, and I think companies could do, is we, you've got to know the stats. You've got to know who of your employees come from where mm. and what their background is, what their colour is. You've got to know that. And then we put in the thing and said, OK, we're now going to question, we're now going to hold heads of departments responsible for getting more people from ethnic minorities into their, uh, into their departments. Once you do that, miracle of miracles, it happens because their, their bonuses are in question. Their, but we, and we then had a kangaroo court. We mm. then used to get them in every three months and say, look, your numbers haven't got any better. What are you going to do about it? And actually, they did get better. I think it's important to get um, uh, some, some examples in. The way my hair is now, I wouldn't want to wear this for an interview unless I absolutely had to, because I would think that that would pay, play a part in me not getting the job, because my hair is not European slick, straight, or it's not conservative enough. Femi, do you think that's true? That, um, that she has to change her hair? Or do you think that's her own perception of it? There will be an element of that. Um, I mean, like I said, if you... That level of prejudice just does exist. I mean, I remember as a, as a kid, uh, my three, two of my friends, um, both of them were white, and we were sat in the playground waiting to get let into lunch. And there was a teacher stood, stood letting people into lunch. And we thought, let's just do a, um, a, a little test. And so they untucked their shirts, undid their blazers, um, un und undid the top button, pulled down their ties. And I just had one top button undone. And we single filed past the teacher to see which one would be get stopped. It was me. Yeah. Is that why you wear T-shirts like that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Rachel, I don't think anyone um, can argue or dispute those facts. And I think it's a shame because I think businesses should want to be more diverse because when you're diverse, you're not only representing your customers, but you've got different voices and perspectives and experiences, which I think is welcomed in business. And I think to your point, anonymised um, applications, they can be a very good thing. I wouldn't even go as far as saying that you're male or you're 50. I would actually argue that your age, your gender, and your name, etc. In many you cases, can't have someone's age. No, I'm just saying that actually it's kind of irrelevant. You, you can't. You and, can't and, have someone's age. Not and what now. you do, I used to run employment um, roadshows, and what people you say when it comes to age, you'd get older people saying that they were discriminated right. against because of their age. Then you'd right. get younger people saying that they weren't getting opportunities because mm. of their lack of experience. Right, actually, I'm running a cocktail bar. 
right? Yeah. And I want my staff on roller skates. I want hunky looking young men and, hunk- and great looking young women racing around on roller skates. I am not going to employ me. So how do I make sure so I don't interview me? You probably wouldn't apply for that. Job no, no, but they might. Well, I don't know. How probably probably would. Would. Probably <laughs> but probably how would. does that work? That is a certain look I want for my cocktail bar. That's why these kids racing around on roller skates. And I've got, and I've got me turning up. Yes, it's madness. And, and no, it's not only you turning up, but we've got to interview you for half an hour, because otherwise you yeah. seem to be... Oh, rude. that's absurd. We, it happens all the time that you see, you know you're not going to give somebody a job after five minutes, don't yeah. you, a lot of the time. And, other, but that, but that, and, and the danger is that that could be because of... Face if you're not careful. But if you had your way, you'd have people submitting a picture. No, I with wouldn't. With a CV. No, no, He's all right. He's quite fit. He no, I would not. But if I'm running yeah. my cocktail bar, I should be able to choose the people that show the look of the, of the bar or the restaurant or whatever it well, is. Well, all I'll say to you is, I hope you never apply for a job. Have you ever seen me on roller skates? Have you ever seen me on roller skates? I've got to be honest, key. I haven't. I think I can live without that image. <laughs> anyway, pads. you're watching <laughs> The Pledge on Sky News. And coming up, why there should be nothing controversial about protecting victims of domestic abuse. Domestic abuse is a cancer on society. It's one which affects millions of adults and millions more children. This week finally saw the Domestic Abuse Bill have its first reading in the Commons. Whilst containing some good aspects, the bill is a missed opportunity to better protect and support the child victims of domestic abuse. One feature of the bill which has created widespread debate is the proposal to use lie detectors to monitor offenders. Initially as a pilot, perpetrators will take the test three months after prison release and see it repeated every six months. Personally, I can't see the controversy in this. Any measure that protects victims of abuse and ultimately saves lives should be welcomed. If people don't feel safe in their homes because of the very people supposed to love them, then we, as a society, have very sadly failed. Well, Michelle, I'm I'm really glad you brought up this subject. I think it's really, really important. And I also uh, welcome the domestic abuse bill um, that is now back in Parliament. Um, I think that the idea of lie detector tests I'm less welcoming of. I'm not sure that that is necessarily effective. And I also think it's interesting that um, when uh, women's organisations or organisations that are that campaign uh, for better protections against domestic violence, um, they are asking for different ways of, of strengthening that bill. Um, they want to see things like provisions um, so that migrant women are defended because quite often their status can be used either to pressure them or might make them fearful about coming forward. Uh, They've asked for guarantees around um, putting people on priority lists for accommodation. Mm -hmm. So if they need to flee a violent home, that it's possible for that to happen. One of the biggest causes of homelessness in this country is is people fleeing domestic violence. Uh, So they've asked for uh, lots of other things um, that would strengthen that bill. Uh, but not necessarily the lie detection. The reason that, because I agree with you, I think the bill um, fails in lots of areas, Mm. as I said, particularly surrounding the child victims Mm. of it. But when I think when it comes to lie detectors, anyone that's experienced domestic abuse will know that at its core often is manipulation. Hugely, people that domestically abuse are hugely uh, manipulative. And a lie detector test can be a strong tool. They don't convict just off that, by the way. They don't say, right, you, you failed, get yourself back to prison. That's not what they're proposing. That would be silly. What they're proposing is that that would become a tool which forms part of evidence when looking at whether or not this person needs to be recalled to prison for breaching their licence. Nick, why are you shaking your head at me? Because... uh... Obviously, anything that can be done, I'm not stupid, anything can be done that can stop and crack down on domestic abuse is to be applauded. But I just don't have the same level of faith in lie detector tests whatsoever. They can, these people who are manipulative, apparently, I've never done it, but you can actually train yourself quite easily to mm. beat a lie detector. And, and I'm always 
wary of laws with unintended consequences and what you might do, and I have no time at all for someone who has committed domestic abuse, but you could actually, because of a lie detector test, get completely the wrong readings about someone who's innocent. I but just don't put the same faith You wouldn't go just alone. So by the way, we use this in this country for sex uh, offenders already, and we've sent 160 of them back to prison in part because of their lie detector stuff. So I'm not advocating what else, that on the back... Well, it's various different things. So when you've been released from prison for domestic abuse, there'll right. be various different license conditions attached to you, whether it's, I don't know, you, no, can't go, you can't contact your former partner or you can't go here or you can't do this. There'll be various different aspects attached to you and your license and your conditions for being in but, society. But ultimately, you might be left with, and most cases are of the woman being the victim, I appreciate not always, but the woman saying, He's threatening me, he's stalking me, he's doing this, he's ringing me late at night, and he says, no, I'm not, mm -hmm. and it'll go to a lie detector. What are you going to do then? Well, you'd look at the character, and if this is well, a person, but bearing in mind this is a person again, that's been released from prison. I want to do anything to put him behind prison, bars, providing he's guilty. Well, bearing in mind this perpetrator has been released from prison, so he's not just like a casual, you know, no. he's been in prison no, for He's this. saying he's tidied up his act, she's saying I ha he hasn't. Where do you go? There's, you go? Another, there's well, another way of looking at this, it's on a similar argument to you, but the other side. What if the person has been reoffending and, tra and trains himself to beat a lie detector test and gets a, a reading that he is telling the truth when in fact he is oh, yeah. still beating a woman, for example? That, well, that's I think the risk. For the accuracy, I think it's about 80, 90 percent or so that they're saying that these things are accurate. And as I'm saying, you wouldn't take it as a standalone tool. And what they're proposing in this instance is a trial. So they're proposing taking, I think, 300 perpetrators over the course of a three year period and looking at whether or not this works. And if it works and it's effective, then it would be rolled out nationally. Mm. And that's the thing that I agree and support. So yeah, I, on, the, on, the, on the core principle of this as somebody who knew someone growing up who was a quite strong victim of, of, the, of this issue. Uh, I fully support anything that, anything that we, can be done, but as long as we are sure that it works, and if it's being used as a trial, perhaps, um, but just on the issue of, of how bad it can get, domestic abuse is a cancer on society. I know that um, my friend, he w used to get into fights at school, his parents would beat him, and that just reinstills this idea of mm -hmm problems are solved through violence. You make your children worse as a result of it. You create lasting problems that will exist throughout their lives. It is so damaging. Je Jess Phillips, the Labour MP who's campaigned a lot on this, yeah. has doubts about uh, lie detectors. Let's have a look. I worry that actually what it will be used for is to cut corners when actually when people are released on bail or on licence. Um, actually, what we need is good police responses, a responsive police who come when they're called, uh, proper orders that offer restraints for women and their children against violent perpetrators. I, I've, I've, I've no idea actually what the benefit of lie detector tests are. I, I, I'm willing to be proven wrong in this. However, it, it just seems a bit gimmicky to me. I mean, that's where I agree with her. That mm. what you, you know, we don't. The danger is you put things in just because that's the fashionable thing to do. Whereas actually what you want to do is to try things, test them, do proper research and see if they work or don't work. Mm. I, I've not seen any evidence that lie detectors are particularly effective, and yet they're in widespread use in America. I think coming back to your point about the kids, the thing is, as a child, when you experience domestic abuse, you are taught, brought up to survive. You are living in an environment which is so frightening. You're so afraid. And, you know, you're not sheltered by love. You're contained by fear. And then what we then expect for these children who, do, who wouldn't know a healthy relationship, you know, if it stood in front of them, you expect these children to come out of that environment and go on to mm. conduct healthy relationships and they struggle. And then when they struggle and often cycles of abuse get repeated through the generations. And I think this bill, it was such a missed or is still such a missed opportunity to get interventions into supporting the children because children are not just witnesses of domestic abuse, they're victims of it. And that for me, yes, Lady Texas is one thing that we can agree and disagree with, but the child thing, they've missed a trick on this one and it's sad. What would you have liked to have seen in there? Well, I would have liked to have seen access to proper services for children. So first of all, acknowledge children as victims because when, and I lived in this environment, my entire childhood was affected by domestic abuse and it was awful. And the damage that that did to me as an adult, it's hard for me to explain what it did. I did not understand healthy relationships. I did not understand how to demonstrate love. So, so I how want... would you understand a helpline? 
No, I'm not talking about helplines. I'm no, talking about when what? you go what? into an environment. So I was on the social services at risk right. register as a child. Right. But when you go into a home environment where there is domestic abuse, the victim of that is not yeah. just the mum, it's the mm. children. But so you what intercept. should have been there for you that wasn't? Well, so first of all, you have the acknowledgement that a child is not just a witness, it's a victim. That's the first key thing sure. that's missing from this. The second thing is there should be provisions where those children can be, whether it's counselling, whatever it is, that is most basic form counselling, where these children are taken into an environment where they're helped and educated and almost re you need a rewiring. Mm. And unless you've experienced it, it's hard to comprehend. But you need a rewiring so councils should be mandated when you're dealing with a family that's experiencing abuse, you have to provide facilities for those children to support. <laughs> What, like overnight facilities, the child comes, you, you take the child away. I'm asking, I'm, well, no, I'm not so confronting you. Well, no, so what happens you, in I... domestic abuse is but... we have various different refuges. So often people flee as a family. Yeah, you flee as a family. So it's not about that. It's not about taking people out. It's about okay. helping to rewire that child's brain. Okay. Anyway, we could, we could go on and on with this one, couldn't we? I'm sure. Yeah. Michelle, it's a, it's a very moving story. And of course, for those of us who didn't have that sort of background, it's, it, I don't think we can ever fully appreciate it. No, I, I understand. Um, right, I think what we should do now is change the mood. Whilst I believe passionately in the subject we've been discussing, I also believe passionately in the strength of women. I've never liked you. There's All this talk about paying more tax. There's only one winner here. Yeah, I know, thank you. That's me. Yeah, in your dreams, Dyke. <laughs>
If you tell your little boy to be strong, but not your little girl, you're saying to your children, I only want one of you to be able to defend yourself in future. As far as I'm concerned, that's child neglect. Accepting the fantastic example that we've just seen on screen, and of course uh, noting that and commending it, do you not accept that the average man is going to probably be, not emotionally necessarily, but physically stronger than the average one? You don't accept that? I, but... accept, I accept that basic okay. premise. Now, do you therefore accept that while everything should be done, and if young girls want to become body lifters, weight lifters, whatever it might be, that is fantastic. We, we must be, just allow for what nature has, rightly or wrongly... I don't know why you're shaking your head, I'll come to you in a moment. Because it's not true. You think the average woman is stronger than the... I, a... I mean, I don't know what an average means, but you, you honestly think that. For a long time, people thought uh, in sport that there was a difference in muscle comp composition between men and women. What we're looking for is this quick twitch, fast twitch muscle, which um, explains elite performance in things where you need spurts of strength. So weightlifting, boxing, explosive energy. Uh, a study last year found that that is no, it's not true. They looked at the muscle composition of elite female weightlifters and they found that there was no difference uh, they had exactly the same uh, proportion of fast twitch muscle in some cases higher than the men. Muscle. Let's so just bring what it down. we're, so what we're finding, there's a woman could beat Tyson Fury. So what we're finding is that the I science is just catching up with the idea that there actually is no reason. Well, actually, let's in terms of gender, why? Uh, there should be a difference in strength. It's how you're trained, and it's also what you're taught to think about your own capabilities. Oh, well, let's, let's have a look at a proper match. Let's get ready to rumble! Please welcome today's contestants in the ultimate battle of the sexes. In the red corner, it's the thunder from the Humber, Michelle Mighty Dubry! And in the pink corner, it's the Hefe from the FA, Greg, the giant dice! <laughs> now, I want a good clean fight between the two of you. Get in your positions. Three, two, one, fight! Greg's looking calm. Greg's looking calm. Michelle's training. <laughs> oh, Greg's starting to wobble. Oh, <laughs> and the thunder from the Humber takes it. Regardless of whether or not um, there's a physiological difference in men and women, the fact is, even if we were to accept that, that men are always going to, on average, be slightly Thank stronger, you. even if we accept Thank that, you. why are we telling our boys to pursue physical strength more than our girls? No, I'm with the you best way to address that, yeah. in theory, actually, logically, would be to I'm tell girls more than boys to pursue physical strength in order to yeah. fix that imbalance. Oh, I get that. Yeah. I get that. Well, you're obviously one hull of an arm wrestler, Michelle. Congratulations to you. I've got to be honest, I had a right sweat on. I was really trying as well on that. And uh, Greg, I think Greg let me win. There's a part of me that actually thinks that. Um, but what well, I You'd have been say... terribly upset if you'd lost, wouldn't you? Of course I would have. Yeah, never exactly. Never so Imagine just... going back to Hull, yeah. having lost to you, Greg. And yeah, yeah, yeah. An, old, an old southerner. <laughs> 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 think, I don't know who southerner. the top tennis stars are. Do you think Maria Sharapova could beat Rafael Nadal or whatever No, it I think that, you know, and I base this on no science whatsoever, but I do think that on the average average an average man would be stronger than your yes. average woman but I don't understand this obsession with trying to make men and women the same I think that actually you know it's not about for me when I, if I had a girl or a boy I would want those uh, children to be as physically like I went to karate from being five years of age my whole childhood I did um, and I would want my child to be able to self-defend yeah. yeah. I think that's really important yeah. whether you're a girl or a boy and if my child was into sports I would want to encourage that as much as possible irrespective of their gender so I think as a parent if you put your own kid into you're a girl so go sit there and play with a doll you're a boy go do weightlifting then I think that's you being silly as a parent yeah. and, 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 re and research shown done by a woman in sports shows that 76% of boys felt that they were encouraged by their parents to pursue physical strength whereas just 67% of girls felt the same you are creating an
an imbalance, well, you're worsening an imbalance in society. And it's just not good. There's a stat from Women in Sport that did says... Did you let me win, Greg? Did, did I let well, you win? Did you? I just enough. Oh, I, no, I didn't. Thank you. I didn't. I would, I would Can you take a lie detector? <laughs> yes, because I didn't want to go up to Hull and get a lot of flack from people. So I thought, Why no, no, I did, didn't let you in. Why is my... Anyway, you were about to say something sensible. I was going to say something quite profound, but I forgot <laughs> that now. It was just said that 28% of girls aged 14 to 16 enjoy playing sport, where boys, the figure's much greater than that. And I, I, I don't think that is... Natural. I don't think it's. Right. I just think it's about the socialisation of what happens. I think you're right about the socialisation. So we're, even when we look at um, people who are at the top of their game, so Andrea Petkovic, who's a German tennis player, she's ranked 82 in the world. She says about. Um, muscles, developing muscles. She says, I just feel unfeminine. I feel like there are millions of people who watch me on TV who think I look like a bodybuilder because of my muscular physique. I would love to be a confident player that is proud of her body, but as a woman, we are judged more. Our physicality is judged more and it makes us self-conscious. So even someone at the top of their game mm. thinks that. And I think there is a lot of socialization around that. So women feel like developing muscle and being strong is in some way unfeminine. I think that is a socialization. And it's, and it's because of the fact that we, we, we separate the ideas of what a boy should pursue and what a girl should mm. pursue right from an early age. Therefore, a, we put the boys in, in these more rough and tumble sports so that boys grow up thinking that the way they should judge people is, that, is on their ability oh. to survive in those sorts of games, i.e. judging people based on their physical strength. And that, and that will, um, well, right now, disproportionately disadvantage women. Well, I think it's even more simple and than that and you won't agree with what I'm about to say but I think in society women are conditioned to what is socially acceptable based on what is attractive to men that's yeah. what I think so I think as a woman you have this image and I know you probably won't agree but as a as a woman there are your pushed images about what is sexy mm -hmm. and attractive yep. and feminine. feminine and it is all based on what men perceive whoa. to be attractive whoa, whoa. and Daniel and Craig think... coming out of the water in his swimming trunks it's not the same I didn't Come say it's the same. I'm talking about girls, and we're talking no, 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 about that body we're, both we're, we're talking about strength, and that is... I, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure it would apply to you coming out of the... No, I don't think it would for a second. But let's not forget, there is... There is <laughs> no, listen. <laughs> sit on the roller skates. So, yeah. the media plays a massive role in what we find sexy. Uh, so, um, what, was, what was considered to be attractive 100 years ago would be a, a, much, more, a much more fuller woman, yeah. whereas, whereas right, now, whereas right yeah. now, thanks to especially magazines and fashion, a, 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 a thinner woman. And then we, now we've moved in the J-Lo direction but, um, with, with more curves. But, but, it changes based on what the media the, tells us. We've gone from Cary Grant to Daniel Craig. It's the same for both sexes. But the fact is, if we if we were to encourage women to pursue, um, to pursue sport, if that was if a more muscular woman was was portrayed in in, in the media and films as the attractive female in those storylines, it would change the perception of, as to what we perceive as sexy. But remember, you're coming from a culture. I mean, where the, the Football Association, for instance, mm. banned women's football for 50 years because mm. yeah. they thought it wasn't. It wasn't ladylike. And you think, now, you look at what's happened in recent years, where there are some very good people working in women's football who have managed to get hold of quite a lot of money out of the mm. FA, and actually the growth in women's football is enormous mm. compared to the growth in men's football at the moment. And, and it's, so it's about culture. Okay. I'll, just to, to be blunt, I just want a world where, the, in the mind of every single creep out there, the thought, that girl might kick my ass, is bedded in, into their head. So. And thanks to the ongoing saga of Brexit, you would be forgiven for thinking that politics is, well, boring. But it seemed like hope was on the horizon, in the form of the race to be the next Labour leader. After all, who could forget the 2010 contest, the ultimate sibling scandal when David Miliband's dear brother Ed stole the job from right under his nose? Or the shock victory in 2015 when, oh, Jeremy Corbyn took the reins after a fiercely fought fight between the left and the lefter than the left? But the contest in 2020 looks set to go down in history as the dullest one ever. Whether it's Long Bailey, Nandy or Sir Starmer, who end up as the honourable leader of the opposition, it's safe to say that this contest hasn't provided the light-hearted relief we were all hoping for. Until now. Step four, the often overlooked deputy leadership race. Take a look at, doc at candidate Dr. Rosina Eileen Khan's unique way of topping off a closing statement. You've still, you've still got another 25 seconds to sing it. <laughs> if I could turn back the time, if I could find a way, I'd take back all the words that have hurt you, and you'd stay. <laughs> 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 
For single-handedly managing to save us from certain boredom, Dr. Rosina, you are our Parliamentary Pop Star of the Week. <laughs> That's all we've got time for this week, but if you want to join in the debate, just search for us on Twitter or check out the Sky News Facebook page. And if you want to listen on the go, you can find the Pledge podcast on Apple, Google, or Spotify. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>